Welcome to episode 6 of Gringo Gone Wild. I'm Rusty Johnson. Now as these first episodes really start with my time through Africa, I really went to see the wildlife. Um, I found this watering hole one day in the uh, middle of uh, Hwangi National Park in Zimbabwe. If you ever visit Africa, go to Hwangi National Park. I was driving around through there hours and hours and I ran into this watering hole. So what I ended up doing, and it was pretty busy. Uh, with wildlife. So I just parked the Land Cruiser about 30 yards from the water's edge and I threw a soft blanket on the hood of the truck and laid on top and stayed silent as I could. And the watering hole was no larger than a soccer field. And aside from several wildebeest grazing in the background, it seemed pretty empty of life. Its flat shoreline and the stillness of the water gave the illusion like it was a giant mirror that had just fallen from the sky. Soon life began to emerge all around me. First, a pair of Egyptian geese flew in from the north and landed in front of the truck. Each slowly waded into the pool until they began to carry their buoyant bodies into the middle. After dipping their heads into the water and printing their feathers, they just slowly floated about. Then my attention was drawn to a splashing sound off to the right. It was an elderly male baboon smacking the surface of the water with his hands, and a troop of thirty or more arrived after him, a loose pack like a tribe of prehistoric humans. It kind of reminded me of just a, a public beach. They kind of all separated into their own groups, uh, claiming their own spot next to the water's edge. The larger groups contained entire families with overactive babies, really wearing down the patience of their parents. And the smaller groups were kind of adolescents. They groomed each other like teenage girls and seemed to be the show-offs of the troop. Several older baboons were more the swing and single type. They wandered up and down the beach side trying to impress the opposite sex while occasionally taking wild punch at a rival to prove their dominance. The baby baboons began to wander away from their parents and wildly look for trouble. There were 12 infants, some clinging upside down to their mother's chest and were small enough to fit in the palm of your hand. Although small, the young displayed amazing feats of strength. They would wrestle and play tag and even lift giant balls of dried elephant dung over their heads before hurling them at their playmates like dodgeball. Soon after, their mothers would try to calm them down with a gentle yank on the tail, while the elderly adults sat stone-faced like old disapproving school principals. It is fascinating how human-like baboons behave. When watching them, one can see raw basic human behavior that form us all. The first wild baboon I have ever counted was scaling a fence in Botswana. Until I approached for a closer look, I was convinced it was a small human. I will always remember that eerie feeling I got when I approached to greet him. Our eyes met, and he proved me wrong. Suddenly, the baboons began to get restless, and several of the large adults made a loud barking sound. Immediately, the entire troop backed away from the water, and the parents gathered their young. While using their tail for a kickstand, they all stood on their hind legs and stared towards the water. The sun's reflection off the water hid what was there. Then about 20 foot offshore, the water started to churn. As the troop began to wrangle their young, they barked louder and louder. The surface began to settle when a long, dark figure slowly began to appear through it. Two eyes bulged out of the water like a submarine's periscope. It was a crocodile. Just as quickly as it appeared, it slipped back beneath the water and the baboons began to settle down, but stayed a safe distance from the water. Then one of the large adults climbed up a 40-foot tree and sat on the branch all by himself, as if sitting as a lifeguard. He began to look out for the entire troop, gazing from under his prominent brow, surveying the land for predators. While this was taking place, the Egyptian geese hightailed it back toward shore and were nervously honking as they paced back and forth. The water began to ripple again, and then a thin split in the water rolled towards the shore as the ridge of the crocodile's head barely peeked over the surface. Slowly he emerged from the dark water and gently slid his body over the mud. The crocodile lifted her over 12-foot, 500-pound body off the ground and lumbered up to dry land. Its belly was distended and hung to the ground, swinging side to side, proving to be void of food. Unexpectedly, a second crocodile crawled out from the water, which startled the geese into flying directly over us towards the sun. This crocodile was slightly larger than the other and had a completely empty stomach. He flopped down next to the other, and like flipping a switch from animated to inert, they both lay in the sand as still as statues. As I was watching him, something else on the horizon caught my attention. It was a grove of acacia trees way off on the horizon, and then coming out from behind them was a herd of elephants. 
Now, as the elephants approached the watering hole, the grazing wildebeests indignantly removed themselves from the elephant's path without ever raising their heads from the grass. As the elephants gained excitement from the smell of water, they also gained speed. The herd's matriarch galloped to a stop at the edge of the watering hole, and all thirty of their followers lined their broad couch pillow-like feet next to her, unrolling their trunks to drink. An elephant essentially walks on its tiptoes atop a rough, fatty, shock-absorber-type sole, and that helps the elephants carry that heavy weight and move silently. This was a maternity herd, consisting entirely of females and their young. The matriarch that Boley led the herd was a towering nine feet tall, weighed about 9,000 pounds, and her long tusks and sunken temples showed her age. She must have been over 50 years old. And the dark scars carved along her tusks told her life story like a totem pole. Her herd was one of the very few that survived the poaching era. The majority of African elephants have been killed for their ivory tusks. Each elephant inhaled over 10 gallons of water at a time and then sprayed it into its mouth like a fire hose. Some babies were only three foot high and always stood beneath their mothers or relatives. Although still nursing, the little tiny ones tried to vacuum up small handfuls of water with their trunks, but the water would always seem to spill out before it reached their mouth. One newborn elephant finally gave up and stuck his whole face underwater to see if it could get better luck. After getting their fill of water, they proceeded to lean on their sides and fall into the watering hole. And as they bathed, the adults trumpeted and sprayed water in the air while they rolled a thick coat of mud over their skin. When they were all covered with mud, they rose up to their feet and gathered back into a tight formation. After communicating with the series of low-pitched grumbles, they made sure their young were guarded on all sides. The giant matriarch trumpeted, and they all marched behind her across the savannah. As the herd moved away, night began to fall. In the distance, you could see their dim silhouettes throwing trunkfuls of sand over their backs as the young weed between their legs as if playing amongst forest trees. Like being squeezed by an invisible lasso, the entire herd drew closer together, then headed into the darkness. With night gradually overtaking the watering hole, the baboons raced around it like a stage crew closing for a show. They all dipped their lips into the water and enjoyed a nightcap and filed into the bush to climb into the trees for the night. The stirred up water settled like a mirror again and the crocodiles switched back to animate mode, sliding their bodies back beneath the dark water. Then along with the rustling sounds of baboons settling in the trees, the day ended. It was, a, it was really odd, though, to think it. It was almost like a, a theater production. You know, center stage was the watering hole. Uh, the baboons was the stage crew. Uh, the geese were the warm-up acts, and the headliners were the elephants. Crocodiles were the security. They cleared the stage for the main act and then returned to duty after the show, just as the great production manager shut off the lights. But the more I thought, the more I realized that the darkness not only concluded the performance, it began another one. This one starred two hungry crocodiles. Now, as I mentioned, these elephants were extremely lucky that they got through the poaching era. And nowadays, their shoot-on-sight policies uh, for people poaching, um, they do many, many things now to try to protect them. Some work good, some don't. Uh, the best I've heard so far is actually implanting GPS uh, monitors in the tusks, so at least they... If they get killed, they can track the tusk exactly to the source. Uh, another one I saw was where they would dye the tusks, or the, even like the horn of a rhino, pink, uh, to where the poachers wouldn't want it. It could be, couldn't be used. That, I believe, does not work. And the reason being is, yeah, they, if they, they can't use the ivory uh, or the horn uh, because it is dyed pink. But what happens if they kill the animal anyway, they still make money. Because what happens is that these, the ivory becomes stockpiled or the horn becomes stockpiled. And just like a commodity, the less there is of something, the more it's worth. So if they kill that animal anyway, pink or not, the stockpile of ivory or horn that they have at the time ends up being more valuable. So the dying pink uh, doesn't really save them at all. But a lot of it, I think, is, you know, what, what the real question is, is, what, you know, the poachers themselves. Uh, these aren't multi-million dollar people who are coming in, a jet, in, in jets. That, they, that might be the end source, but the, the poachers are the locals. 
and then you have to decide whether what is a poacher is is a poacher just a man fighting for survival trying to get money for food for his children and his family um or is he you know a law-breaking poacher uh, and down there it's it's a big question i think really the answer is 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 taking these these poachers and give them jobs as protectors as rangers as protectors of the elephants uh, they have a tremendous amount of knowledge of tracking them and knowing where they are because uh, they have their boots on the ground all the time uh, is what's really going to save them thank you so much for listening to episode six of gringo gone wild please visit gringogonewild.com and subscribe so i can give you a heads up when the new episodes come out i hope you had a good time and stay tuned and remember in the end All we have is our stories.